internal degree in physics from the University of Buenos Aires and his PhD in condensed matter physics from the State University of New York. In 2000, he moved to Washington DC to work at the Navy Research Lab, uh, first as a postdoc and then as a, a research physicist uh, staff member. Among the recognition he got, uh, he received the NRL review and the Alan Lerman Award for the quality of his publications. Um, his interest is interests are optical spectroscopy of semiconducting materials. Um, he's been researching in, in that area in particular. Uh, he's been research on this based nanostructure drawn by chemical synthesis, synthesis far infrared magneto spectroscopies of graphene. Um, also involved in MBE ground structures for far infrared antimonide based detectors and all the junction power cells. So, welcome. So, I just wanted to start by saying thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about optical properties of left side nanostructures, but I'm going to do a little PR before. And so, I'm going to switch here. So, as you heard, I, I work at the Naval Research Laboratory. The Naval Research Laboratory is located in Washington, D.C. We have about 3,000 people. There's lots and plenty of toys to play with. Here I put an example here. There's a lot of stainless steel that you can see in here. These are MBE machines. And these machines are used, for instance, to grow semiconductor materials. You can grow them with layers and at one layer at a time. And these are some, some of the examples. This is one of the facilities that we have. We, we have three fives, and that involves, basically you have to combine an element from the column three and an element from the column four, or five, so that would be like gallium and arsenide, or indium or arsenide. But then we also have growth capabilities for group four, those are silicon and germanium. And we also have capabilities for the three nitride, so basically gallium nitride, aluminum nitride. Um, so it's a good place to, to work at. And in here, I'm just, we're just showing some of the optical characterization systems that we have. In here, we're basically combining three labs right now. We have plenty more. But this one, for instance, is a CL system. So we can go basically from 200 nanometers all the way to 0.2 terahertz. So it's basically 10 to the 6 nanometers. And the, my lab in particular it involves the picture over here, where we have a triple spectrometer and some cryogenics, uh, like the cryostat in there, and this picture right here where we have an FTIR, magnetic fields, and some uh, uh, optics for, for that. We also have, uh, we're also working in conjunction with the ultra-fast system that also we can do it out in the terahertz. So this was just kind of an overview. We have some programs for undergrads and for postdocs, and these are the links. So for instance, there's an undergrad and grad program for a 10-week summer, and the link is up here on the top. And then we have two programs for postdocs, that's the NRC program and the ASEE. In all these programs, you need to basically find somebody inside NRL, because what you're going to do is, these are websites where you go, and this one in particular, you go, and you basically just input your information into a database. But if nobody knows inside NRL that you're interested in working on that system, they might not actually look for you in that, in that database or whatever. So it's always important to try to contact somebody inside. And then for the NRC programs and the ASEE, you basically have to find for a, an advisor inside there, and then you apply for that particular program with the advisor inside. And now I'm going to go and leave it to the talk. So one of the projects that we've been working on and we're heavily invested right now, it's on proper optical properties of the lead selenide nanostructures. We're going to talk about nanocrystals, spherical nanocrystals, and then we're going to talk about nanowires in which these are very elongated structures in one dimension. So this involves a lot of different people. These are all staff at NRL. I do optics. We have people doing synthesis, Janice Berger and Ed Foos and people that do EPR and ODMR. We have Furious, Efros, and Erwin. And we can look with the uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy and basically see up the, with the structures that we're drawing. And we've been trying some transport that I might just touch a little bit, but it's just a preliminary. 
So I'm going to try to go very basic. So the way that in, I look at the semiconductor and it's in my head, a semiconductor is a periodic array of atoms. So you're going to have the ions that it could, they could be, for instance, gallium arsenide or cadmium selenide or different materials in there. And depending which material you have, the arrangement on the, on the structure is going to be a little bit different. So in that case, what you have is we look at these atoms and th these atoms that are forming this lattice are sharing electrons among themselves. And we're going to separate two kinds of electrons. We're going to call the core electrons. And in the case of the core electrons, these are electrons that are very bound to those ions. So you need a lot, a lot of energy to actually be able to pull those out, basically in the soft x-ray region. Now, there's also going to be other electrons that are going to be lightly bound, and they have certain freedom to move in that lattice. And what I can do is I can come, for instance, with a visible photon and excite that electron out of that bound state, and then the electron now can move freely to the lattice. It's still going to be interacting with all the other ions, and it's going to be moving, depending in which, in which solid you have it, it's going to be moving at a different speed, for instance. And a lot of that we are going to, we're, that interaction we're just going to look at effectively, and we're going to define what is going to be the effective mass. So you grab one material, it has a particular, you grab gallium arsenide, you'll have certain effective mass. You grab another material, we'll have a different ma effective mass. And instead of having to think about that electron interacting with billions and billions of other atoms, we just think of it as a free particle moving through the solid with a particular effective mass, where we dumped all the stuff that we don't know into that number. The other thing that happens is now you have this empty state that you left behind because you pulled that electron out of there. So if another electron comes here, it's going to try to fill that hole. And what can happen is that maybe this electron that is in this balance band over here can go and fill that hole over there. So effectively now my hole is moving the other way. So to make this, the, the problem a little bit simple, at least in our head, we're going to be talking about electrons and holes. And we're going to think of the electron being a negative charge and the hole being a positive charge. And the speed that this electron, these holes are going to be moving is different. So that means that the effective mass of this electron is going to be different than the effective mass of that hole. So we just kind of simplify this problem by not thinking about this empty state, and we call it a hole, and we just think of it as being a particle, and this guy as being an electron. The other thing that can happen now is, basically, this particle that I have over here is a positive charge, and this one is a, is a negative charge. So they're going to try to bound to each other. They're going to try to form like a planetary system in there. And that hole and electron that are bound together and moving around, we're going to be calling it the exciton. So you're going to be hearing a lot of Talk, when I talk, you're going to hear excitons, you're going to hear about electrons, and you're going to hear about holes. And we're going to talk about effective mass. So there's some, there's some physical properties with these electrons and holes. So basically, if I'm going to put some voltage across my semiconductor, I'm going to be attracting the electrons in one direction and the holes in the other direction. Because as I said before, the electron is a negative charge, and the hole is going to be a positive charge. So that's one of the properties of these electrons and holes moving into this new system. The other thing that's going to happen is they're going to have different effective masses because I said they move at different, at different speeds. And then there's another property that is going to be the spin. That electron in there can have a spin plus or minus one half. And if I turn on a magnetic field inside my, my semiconductor, I can be aligning in that spin. So if I turn on a magnetic field, I'm going to try to align that spin of the electron in there. So these are all the properties that we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at charge, effective mass, and spin. And we always think about the electrons and holes moving into this system. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about quantum confinement. So, in quant so I hope everybody did uh, in quantum mechanics the problem of a box of the electron in a quantum box. And you know that now the states of that electron inside that quantum box is going to be confined, and you're going to have discrete levels for that. So if I make my semiconductor really small, then I'm going to start going into the quantum confinement region. And really small, it's all given by the Bohr radius. And the Bohr radius is when I have this electron and this hole circling each other, is how if I put them in a big, big material, 
what, what's the orbit of the two electron and holes. And that orbit is going to depend again on the material. If I grab gallium arsenide, it's going to have a certain value. If I grab lead sulfide, it's going to have a certain value. And it depends on the material that you look at. Now, if I start squeezing together the electron and the hole at a distance that is smaller than the Bohr radius, then I start having confinement. And I can start squeezing the electron and the hole in one dimension, and that's what we call a quantum well. So it's free to move still in two dimensions, basically like moving in the cheese of a sandwich. And in the case, but then I can confine it even more if I make now a nanowire. So in this case, I'm going to have two-dimensional confinement or 1D confinement, right? Because it still has one dimension to move freely. And now if I squeeze it from all different directions, then I'm going to be talking about a quantum dot. Oops. So this will take a minute. Okay. And then the other thing that happens is some ca in some cases I can have a nanowire that, is con that has freedom in one dimension and then I, 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 can I can confine in all three dimensions. But there's going to be some cases in between that we're going to call nanorods to make a distinction. So in the case of the nanorod, it's not a one-dimensional system and it's not completely a zero-dimensional system because the confinement in one of the dimensions is a little bit smaller than in the other one. You still see confinement effects, but it's different in this direction than in the other two directions. Now, here are some examples of, of in real life, of lead saline nanocrystals. Those are the little circles over here that's maybe difficult to see. And in this case, the nanorods that are going to be almost in the three dimensions, and then we can do nanowires where they're really long, micron lengths, so they're not confined. They're free to move in that direction and still confined in the other one. And the Bohr radius for lead science is going to be 46 nanometers. So as long as I make any of these structures smaller than 46 nanometers, I'll see confinement. I make them bigger than 46 nanometers, I will not see the confinement effect. So, this is basically the, the nanocrystal in here, and we can see the different discrete levels the same way that you would have an electron in a quantum box. In the case of the electrons here, we have the discrete levels, and you also have the same discrete levels for the holes. If you make the nanocrystal bigger, then those levels are going to become less space, and if you make it smaller, then you're going to be spreading those, just like when you do the quantum box. The smaller you make your box, the more you're going to be pushing your, your materials. So this energy over here, in this black line from here to here, that's the band gap of the material. That I said it depends only on the material you choose. And it's that energy that you need to pull that electron out of the ions and have it free moving through the, through the material. So if I come with a photon from here to here in bulk, I would have it free. But now, if I go to a confined state, in order to move it from here to here, I need a bigger photon. So I'm increasing the band gap of my material. So I can grab a material and the band gap that only depending on the material that I chose, now by size I can tailor it a little more. So that is some of the, that's some of the reasons that what we're, we're dealing with nanocrystals. In this case we're showing cadmium selenide nanocrystals just because they're pretty in comparison to the lead selenide I'm going to show because we cannot see in the infrared. In this case, what we have, this is a, the, all these balls have exactly the same material. It's all cadmium selenide, but because we're changing the size of the cadmium selenide, we're changing the band gap of that material, the color, the, the amount, the photons that we're absorbing in that material. And the, the, the nice part of working with these colloidal nanocrystals is that we can tune the band gap, just like we're tuning the color over here. We, they are very high efficient down converters, and I'll talk about that a little, long, a little bit later. They have high optical quantum efficiencies. That, in, that means that they luminesce very well. If I, shine, if I put a photon in there, I'm going to get a photon coming out. The lifetime of that recombination time is very long, and that's convenient when you're doing a detector, for instance, because you have a lot of time to pull those charges out before you lose it in the form of a photon. They have discrete levels, which means that if, that is the, if the discrete levels are higher than KT, then it's a good material for, for optoelectronics. There are some claims that they might be radiation resistant and they are kind of easy to integrate into hybrid device devices because basically you can just pour them or paint the material that you're going to be looking at. 
And the other advantage is that the methodology is going to be low cost, that uh, we're going to see instead of using one of those big machines of $1 million that you have to be very careful about vacuum and everything, this is all being going to be done with wet chemistry, that all you need basically is a, it's a hot plate, a glove box, it's still some expensive, but it's not as a million dollars that you're going to be spending in that. Now, there's several problems that we are trying to address with different, pro with different programs. One of the problems is to dope this material. If you're going to make an NP junction, you want N-type and P-type material. It's very difficult to dope these materials. I'm not going to be talking about today, but we have a problem in there. And the other problem is, let's say I absorb an electron hole pair in here. If I want to make a detector, I need to pull those charges out. And since it's so confined in the system, it's going to be very difficult to pull that out. And the way that we're looking at doing that is by looking at nanowires instead of nanocrystals. Because we still have the nice optical properties that we can see in the nanocrystals, but now we have a way to pull the electrons one way and the holes the other way. And there's also problems on passivation because they oxidize very fast with the environment. So I mentioned before that the materials are very good down converters. And this has been recently found in general, if you have, for instance, a semiconductor, a photovoltaic, you're going to absorb an electron hole, you're going to absorb a photon, which is going to generate an electron hole pair, and then it's going to re-emit re light. So and sometimes you come with a green photon that has a very high energy, and what's going to happen is your electron hole pair is going to thermalize to a lower energy and emit in the red, for instance. So that energy going from the green photon to the red photon, you've lost in the, in the, in the, as heat. Recently, they have found that in nanocrystals, there's another process that is more effective that is called multi exciton generation. That in the case you absorb a single green photon, and instead of generating one electron hole pair and emitting a red photon, you can emit several photons in the red. So you're not losing that energy in, this, in the form of heat that you had in the, in the nanocrystals. And that has some applications, for instance, in the case of solar cells. So in a solar cell, if I want to absorb this green photon, I'm going to generate this electron hole pair and I'm, going to, and I'm going to go down to this energy. So I'm going to be losing a lot of the energy that I get from the sun. And the way to fix that has been by putting different cells that are going to absorb different colors. So first you put one cell on the top that's going to absorb the green photons and let the red and the blue and the, and the orange ones going down to the bottom and then the next stage is going to absorb the orange ones, and then the next, next stage is going to absorb the infrared. And in that way, you can increase the efficiency of the cells to up to 33%. There has been some, so there has been some claims that if you can do the same with nanocrystals, where we have this down conversion efficiency, you're not losing all that energy as heat, that then with a single cell, you can get up to 65% quantum efficiency if you can pull those electron hole pairs out. But that pull those electron hole pairs out is going to be a big if in there. There's other advantages also in, 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 in these systems that they are good systems for thermoelectrics. So a thermoelectric is basically you're trying, if you have your car running and it gets really hot, the machine, all that heat that you have in your car is energy that you're losing too. Now, if you can convert that heat that you are dissipating on your motor into electricity, then you can recover that system. And the truth is that certain car companies are starting to look into that. So for instance, there's a BMW and there's a GM car now that they're going to be putting thermoelectrics on the escape on the, just to try to recover that heat out of your motor and generate it into electricity that you can use, for instance, in the air conditioning or the radio or the, any other device that you have in that car. The factor that is very important when you're doing a, a, a thermoelectric is the ZT figure of merit. So basically what that does is the top is the electrical conductivity and the bottom is the thermal conductivity. So if I have a car that is very hot and the atmosphere that is at 20, at 20 Celsius for instance or, or 50 Fahrenheit, I want to convert that heat from heat to electricity. If that heat is going to go into the atmosphere, it's energy that I'm losing. So I want to keep the, the heat, the hot part hot and the cold part cold. So that's why you want a, a low thermal conductivity. And on the other hand, you want the electrical conductivity to be very, very, very hard. 
So in order to get a good thermoelectric, you want to maximize the electrical conductivity and minimize the thermal conductivity. The LEDs are a good material here, CTs as a function of temperature, so you want basically a material that's going to be on the top, and the LED, here's LED telluride, is a good competitive material with other systems. What has been shown, at least theoretically, is that if you can do confined nanowires of the same material, then you can increase the, thermo, the, the ZT factor quite a bit. So if you grab the same material that is a good thermoelectric, in principle, if you go to quantum confinement, you can make it even a better thermoelectric material. The reason for that is because in the nanowire, you can still collect those electron and hole pairs, but you're, the, the, way, the, the way that you're suppress, suppressing the thermal conductivity is by reducing the phonons through the material. And having those rough edges in some cases also can, uh, can help for those phonons not to propagate. You still want your electron hole to propagate, but the phonons not to propagate at all. So these are the reasons that we're working today with the lead selenide system. And here's, here's, a, here's the, basically our lead selenide. And here, this is the effective mass of the electron. So that's how fast those charges are going to move, be moving in that material. And this is the band gap of your material. So with confinement, I can actually push my band gap up, but I cannot push it down. I can make that band gap bigger. So we're starting to work with a small band gap material, and then we can tune it to the other materials by quantum confinement. The other reason that it's important to have a small effective mass is because if I have a small effective mass, I have a big Bohr radius. That's those elect the electron and the hole are going to be making a very big orbit. So I can grow it not as small and already start exploiting those confinement effects. So for instance, in the case of lead selenide, if I make my nanostructure smaller than 46 nanometers, I can start already seeing confinement. While if I grab, for instance, gallium phosphide, I need to make them smaller than five nanometers. So it gives me more tunability in that region. And basically by reducing the size, here are different sizes, I can tune it basically all the way from four microns into the near visible. One thing that is important to, to know is that in the case of the lead selenide, this is more going to be for a person that already knows about semiconductors. For you guys, it's going to be information that you don't need to know that much. Is that in the case of lead selenide, it's a direct band gap, but instead of at the gamma point, like in the other materials like gallium arsenide, cadmium telluride, it's a direct band gap at the L point. And that is going to change some of the structure in the sense that the electrons and the holes are going to have very similar effective masses, and they're going to be a very, it's a very symmetric sing, uh, system. The other thing that happens is, at this level, the degeneracy of the L point is fourfold degenerate. So there's actually four bands for electrons and four bands for holes in that particular region. And I'm going to come back to that right now. But just to let you know, the, the synthesis is quite easy. You do it basically in a glass beaker that you put on top of a hot plate to control the temperature with a thermocouple. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be injecting top selenium. This is basically that molecule. It's a phosphorus in the middle, selenium on the top, and this change of carbons on, on different parts. And you're going to be mixing with lead oleate. Basically, you're going to be grabbing the lead from the lead oleate and the selenium from the top selenium, injected inside the, the beaker at a fixed temperature and an inert atmosphere. And those are going to crystallize into lead selenide, and then there's going to be these organics that are going to show like organics coming, sticking out of, of that lead selenide and other components out of the reaction. And then you're just going to separate. So by changing the amount of time that you're letting that growth, you're going to be adjusting the size of your nanocrystals. So if I want a small, if I wait a very short time and then I cool down my reaction, I'm going to get nanocrystals of certain sizes, but if I let it continue growing, I can go up and grow it to a bigger size. And that way we can control the size of our nanocrystals. So here are some nanocrystals again. And in what we're showing over here, the blue line is the absorption spectra. 
we're plotting it as a function of energy in the bottom, but if you want in, as a function of wavelengths it's on the top. So we're close to two micron absorption feature for the 1s, 1p, and that's shown over here. So this again, your confined states for the electrons and the confined states for the holes. In the case, in this particular case, this blue line absorption line corresponds to exciting an electron from the, from the valence band into the conduction band. And in this case, we can also see another feature at a higher energy. And in that case, what we're doing, we're exciting an electron from the S state to the P state of the, of the electron or from the P state of the hole into the S state of the electron. And then you can actually see more bumps in other structures, and that gives you more excited states that you're going to have in that, in that transition. The red curve is the light that is being emitted. So you absorb photons in any of these bands over here, and then it's going to be re-emitted at this particular wavelength. In here, we're comparing now a nanocrystal and a nanowire. So here we have some nanocrystals. These are 6.5 nanometers in diameter, and here we have nanowires that have a diameter of 6 nanometers and very long, several microns in length. In the case of the nanocrystals, again, we can see the absorption, where we can see the, the, the absorption state for the 1s to p state, and then the absorption from the 1s to the 1s, and then the luminescence this is the light that emits out of these nanocrystals. In the case of the nanowires, now the absorption feature is going to be blurred and we can see still the 1s to 1s transition and this is the fall luminescence. Here we have basically the fall luminescence which is indicating the bang up of that material as a function of the diameter of the nanowire. So you can see basically the red curve is a 16 nanometer diameter, 8.2, 6.3 and 5.6 and as we're making them smaller and smaller, we can tune that band gap through the, through the different regions. And in this plot, what we're indicating, this is the confinement effect for the nanowires as a function of the radius. And in this case, th this, the black one is for the nanowires and the green one is for the quantum dots. And the reason for this difference between the one dimension and the zero dimension is basically in the case of the nanowires, we're not confining the electrons and holes in this direction, while in the case of the nanocrystals, we're squeezing them together. And that increases the energies of those transitions. And the, the, the pink uh, dots in the middle, these are going to be nanorods that are going to be between the zero dimensional and the one dimensional. So we can, by changing the dimensions of our nanowires or nanocrystals, we can tune to the particular frequency that we want to get that material. And one of the advantages on the nanowire, see, for the, for the electrons, we can go up to probably 600 MeV, while in the case for the nanowires, we can push it all the way up to the bulk material. And that gives us tunability all the way between 3 and 4 microns, which gives us a possibility of using the nanowires for detectors in the 3 to 4 microns, which, are of, uh, which we can use now for chemical sensing in some cases. The other thing we can do with the nanowires, we can align them. So what we do is we, we have a solution of the nanowires and we can put them on top of a substrate. Here's the drop with the different nanowires and we can apply a bias on a gold pad. And what that's going to do is just the, the, the electrostatics that you're generating by that five uh, volts, it's going to align the nanowires pointing out radially. So we can put two gold pads like we're indicating over here, it might be a little bit difficult to see. But these big structures are just two big gold pads on silicon, and then we put a drop of the nanowires on top while we apply a difference of voltage of five volts, and then we can get nanowires bridging from one side to the other one. So we can bridge and apply now a bias between the two sides of the, of the nanowires and drive those electrons and holes. In this case, we have this structure that's basically the two nanowires where we have a source and a drain, and we can change the voltage and look how the current goes across that nanowire. And in the other case, we can apply a voltage on the bottom of the substrate, which allows us to inject more electrons and change the doping inside that structure. And by doing that, 
initially we had this, uh, this IV curve, this is the current as a function of voltage, and when we're injecting more electrons, now our current is going to be decreased. And what this is indicating to us is that we have a P-type doping, so we have extra holes in that material when we grow it. The other thing that we are able to do is we can shine light on the nanowires and we can see a, 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 we can see response, a photoresponse to the light being off and on. So we can use these nanowires that are being aligned the two goal pads as a detector. Now, as I mentioned before, there's, we can look at the different excited states and there has been a lot of work on the excited states. People have been studying, for instance, how if I put an electron up here, how fast it will decay to this state and how fast it will recombine over there. And we have this structure over here of the different levels of the excited states of the S state, the P state, the S state, and the P state. Now, what we've been doing is we've been studying what's going on in this peak over here, the 1S to 1S structure. Because inside these lines that right now they're drawn as a solid, there's a lot of different lines. There's a fine structure in there that is equivalent to the hyperfine structure in an atom, for instance. If you, that you can have different levels inside that structure. As I mentioned before, the, the bang up at this material is at the L point, and it's fourfold degenerate. So there's four different conduction bands and four different hole bands, and then you have the spin of the electron can be pointing up or down, can be plus minus one half, and the spin of the hole can be plus minus one half. So that will give you, since you have four times two, that gives you eight different states for this electron, and four times two different states for the hole. So there's eight states up here, and eight states are down there. The other thing that happens, because now you have eight states up here and eight states up there, you can have up to 64 different transitions. And there's been a lot of talk on the, on the literature on exactly how, what are the selection rules for those 64 transitions, how to understand all the optics that is going over here. And what we have done is we've been studying those 64 transitions. What we have found in general is that we don't need to look at the 64 transitions. We can simplify the, the problem to four different transitions. And the, the way we're going to do that is when you have quantum confinement or strain, these states that are initially degenerate, are, you're going to break the degeneracy. And they're going to move apart from each other. And we have found that we can understand all the data that we have by looking at only one state for the electron, one state for the hole, and imagine that all these other states are not occupied because the thermal energy that you would need to occupy those states is too high. Now, we still have two particles that the electron can have spin up or spin down. Now, because we have these two particles, you cannot think, the, the picture that I showed you before where you're going to grab the electron and excite it from the S state to the S state, it's, it, that's a single particle problem. So I can grab my electron, move it from one level, put it in the other one. Now I have two particles because I have an electron and the hole. So, and they're going to interact with each other. So it's a many, it's a many body problem. It's a two body problem, but it's a many body problem. So you need to move away from that single particle picture into a two particle picture. And the way to do that is you define a level here that is the vacuum state. So basically you do not have any electrons or holes free inside your semiconductor. They're all bound to the ground state. Now I come with a photon and I can generate an electron hole pair. Now I have an electron that can have spin up or spin down. So this guy has an angular momentum of plus minus one half and this guy has a plus minus one half. So you can get a total angular momentum of one. Since you have now an angular momentum of one, you can, have an ang you can have states with angular momentum zero or angular momentum one. The state with angular momentum one is the singlet state and is given by this state of the spin of the electron going up and hole and in, in a symmetric state. And you can only have the projection of this angular momentum can only be zero. That's the MJ over there. It's the, ang it's the projection of the angular momentum. In the case of the state equal one, now you can have three projections of the angular momentum. It can be plus one, zero, or minus one. And these are the three states. So the plus one state is going to be one half plus one half. The minus one half state is going to be minus one half minus one half. 
So these are, this, this is the fine structure of those electron and hole pairs. If you look at the selection rules, optical selection rules, the photon cannot carry angular momentum. So you cannot change the angular momentum of a state because that would not give you conservation of angular momentum. So a, pho a photon can, has, can only allow the change of angular momentum of equal to zero, but then you can have different, angular, different projections of the angular momentum. Projection of angular momentum zero corresponds to linearly polarized light. Projection of angular momentum plus one is right circularly polarized light, and minus one corresponds to left circularly polarized light. The only state here that is allowed, optically allowed, is going from the vacuum state into this state of j equals zero and mj equals zero. This state is not optically allowed, at least on a single, on a, on a single photon transition because you cannot change, the, this has angular momentum zero, this has angular momentum one, that would break your selection rule of change of angular momentum zero. So that's why we call these states in general the bright states that are optically allowed, and these states over here we call them the dark states. In the case of the nanorods, the selection rules are going to be the same. The only difference is that now this state, that it's not going to be, this, this state becomes non-degenerate from the other two states and we're going to define these energies as delta and delta prime. Where delta is basically the separation of energy between the bright states and the dark states, and delta prime is the separation within the dark states. So we have studied photoluminescence, and what we see when we look at the nanocrystals is that as you change the temperature, the photoluminescence is going to evolve. So at some points you can see a double feature and at room temperature, the higher energy feature is the strongest one, while when you cool down to 4 Kelvin, the lower state is going to be the stronger one. And the way that we are understanding this data is basically that we are changing the dynamics between these two states. These states over here are optically allowed, so that means that these ones are going to reco recombine quite fast. A dark state is one with a lifetime that is going to be infinite. So it, this is not completely dark, but there's going to be some recombination still happening from the dark states, but this recombination channel is going to be much slower than in the case of that recombination channel. Now when we cool down, all my carriers are going to fall down to these states down here. So if I go to 4 Kelvin, all my recombination is coming from this channel that even when it's slower, the electron hole pairs cannot go back into my faster decay channel. And that's why when we cool down, the dark states are the dominant, while in the case at low, higher temperatures, now I can, for, I can externally excite my electron hole pairs, and this recombination is much faster than this one over here. And this is consistent with time resolved spectroscopy that has been done on this system, in which people have found that this recombination channel is of the order of 10 to 100 nanoseconds, while in, the, in this state over here lives for several microseconds. So there's three orders, there's a, there's a, there's a few couple orders of mind difference. We, we can also look at this as a function of the size of the nanocrystal. So this is a nanocrystal is at eight nanometers in diameter. This one is 6.5 and 5.8. And you can see the little shoulder in here showing the other state. And in this case, it's being split. So we can calculate the, we measure the, this energy as a function of the diameter of the nanocrystal. I'm going to sk skip this one here. We were, well, we were looking at a couple of other samples. In one case, these are spherical nanocrystals of about 4.5 nanometers in diameter. And in this case, these are nanorods that are 4.2 nanometers in diameter and 13 nanometers in length. When we look at the optical spectra, we get a good absorption feature for the nanocrystal where we again see the 1s to 1s and the 1s to 1p. We get photoluminescence in around 1.5 microns. In the case of the nanorods, we do not see this excited state anymore. We see this state, the 1s to 1s, and again we see photoluminescence at 1.5 microns. So although the dimensions are a little bit different, the quantum confinement is basically the same in these two samples. 
what we have done is photoluminescence. So in the, in the photoluminescence under magnetic field. So what we do in this case is we, we look at the photoluminescence as a function of magnetic field, and that those are the blue curves. And you can see that when we go from zero to six Tesla, we basically see no change. The photoluminescence doesn't get changed with the magnetic field. But what we did see is we see a difference between the amount of light that is circularly polarized left and right hand. So we look at the, photo, at the photoluminescence and we detect how many photons are coming right hand circularly polarized and how many are coming left side circularly polarized. And what we have found is that as you turn on the magnetic field, there's a dichroism that gets bigger and bigger and it goes linear with the magnetic field. So that dichroism over there, that is the difference between sigma plus and sigma minus, we call the degree of polarization. And what that is indicating, and the only states that can give us an effect of this sort is going to be this dark state over here where you have where you have a angular, a, an angular projection of plus minus one because I told you before that plus one is going to be right hand circularly polarized and minus one is going to be left hand circularly polarized. So any, any photon that comes from this state is going to be sigma minus. Any photon that comes out of this state is going to be sigma plus. So that we can see a difference between the amount of light that comes sigma plus and sigma minus is indicating that the population in this level is different than the population in that level. And the difference of the population on this level to the population in this level is due against to a thermalization effect. When we apply a magnetic field, we can see a Zeeman effect. Because you have, it, you have the Zeeman effect and it's going to be moving this state down while, the, while this state goes up. So if there's more electron hole pairs thermalizing to this level than to this level over there, and that changes the amount of light that hands right and left hands circularly polarized. From measuring this degree of polarization, we can actually fit it, that's the green line over here, and we can extract the G factors of the electron and the hole in this system. Uh, this is basically the equation that you have, it's the brilliant function. You can find it, for instance, in, uh, in, a, in an older version of, um, of Kittel. And basically what's going to do is the degree of polarization is going to depend on KT. So the, cold, the, the lower temperature that I put on this system, the more the difference in populations is going to be on the two systems. And the more I split this with magnetic field, the strong, the bigger that number is going to be. So that's what this equation is telling us. What's the difference of populations between those two states? Now, in the case of the nano, on the nano rods, when we cool down further down the, the nano crystals, the nano rods, we can see that there's a deviation from this linear effect that we were expecting from this function over here. So this brilliant equation over here is not enough to describe our degree of polarization when we change our temperature and our magnetic field. The reason for this discrepancy from the two-level mall is that basically a two-level mall is not good enough. We need to incorporate a third level in there. So when we incorporate now this level over here that is also going to split with a G factor that is going to be now the sum of the electron and the hole because this level is going to split from this level by it's the Zeeman effect again. Now the population of how many electron hole pairs I have in this level in uh, comparison to this level is also going to depend on how many are falling down in this level down here. And when you write now the brilliant uh, equation for a three level model, it becomes a little more complicated. Basically you still have the two level model over here with the three quarters and then you have a correction factor that is basically correcting for this level on the bottom. So we, we were able to fit a, our data and what we can extract is that the difference of the G factor of the electron on the hole is 0.41 while the sum is 2 and that was going to give us, we can calculate from here and you're going to get a G factor of the electron of 1.2 while for the hole it's going to be 0.8. The other thing, so we already had delta from the time, from the temperature 
data, we can get the G factors from there, and now we want to look at this delta prime over there, which is the, en the energy splitting between the, within the, the dark states in there. And the way that we did that is by another measurement. This one becomes a little more complicated now, but it's going to be optically detected microwave resonance. So in this experiment, what you do is you generate an electron hole pair, which is going to recombine and give you a PL. But you do that now where you're now combining it with another photon, which is a microwave photon. So first you generate an electron hole pair with some spin in there, and then you're going to come up with an energy of another photon that's going to be in resonance with, this, with the energy that I need to flip one of the spins around. So my microwave light is going to change that spin, and that's going to change the amount of light that I come out, that, that, I, that I detect. So I look at the amount of light as a function of the magnetic field and this microwave on and off. And when the microwave is in resonance with the magnetic field, then that gives me a resonance in there. And so basically what we're doing is we're flipping with microwave, we're flipping a spin from this level into these levels up here. And we can see the change in the photoluminescence. And this is the result that the resonance that we're getting for this spin flip in between this lower level and these levels up here. And from that, because we already know what the G factors are from our previous experiment, now we can determ determine what's that delta prime in there. And that's a very small energy, 88 micro EV for the nano rods, and for the nano crystals it's much more than 20 micro EV. So just as a conclusion, basically what we have done is we've been looking at this 1S, 1S state that, that we have in lead selenide. We are having a complete picture for that fine structure and the levels that are involved in there. The reason that we want to look at that is, for instance, that process that I was telling you before, the multi extant generation, where I'm going to down convert my electron hole pairs without losing it into thermal effect. In order to be able to predict that system or to understand how that is happening, I need to understand what the fine structure and what levels I have in there. Also, understanding the fine structure is going to change, it, it's going to affect my understanding of the transport properties. Because if I have more states involved in my transport, then my transport is going to go up. So I need to know what's my degeneracy of states down there. So it makes a big difference that I'm going to have 64 transitions or four transitions. At this moment, we have a picture that explains everything with four transitions. And we can also look into that into, and we can look at now at the optical properties of nanocrystals and nanowars. So that's about it. What are they? Uh, like are they just on a slide or do you code them? Uh, so when, when, we do, when we do absorption or photoluminescence, we can do them in, in, in solutions or we can do it on, on, on slides. We just decant them on a, on a surface. Uh, for our experience, what we've been doing, we've been putting them on substrates because it's easier for us to mount them inside the cryogenic, in the cryostats it's going to be a little bit of an issue to find a solution that you can cool down to 4 Kelvin. When we're doing room temperature measurements like the nanowires that I was showing at the beginning, we can do those in either solution or, or films. But we mainly, most of the data here has been in films. So is there ever an issue of whatever solution they're in without actually affecting the measurements you do? Uh, yes, there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different things. So, some people have been looking at the fine structure in, by doing time-resolved spectroscopy. And in that case, the, the ligands that you have on the, on the outside of your nanocrystals change the dynamics, so it will change your lifetime, so it will change your results. If you put them in different solutions, that's going to change your dynamics, change your results. The other things that happens when you put them in films, the, the absorption will always look the same. But when you're doing photoluminescence, Depending how thick you make that, that layer is going to change the amount of light that you have and where the luminescence is going to be at. 
And the reason, f one of the, the reason that it switches the position of your PL is because of re-emission. So basically, if I have a very thick film, I'm going to absorb light, and then that light will be re-emitted, and will be absorbed again and re-emitted. And what will happen is that you will end up having, full, the, the thicker your, your, your film is, you're going to start looking only at the big nanocrystals and not at the smaller ones, because the energy of the smaller ones is a little bit higher. So if I emit light out of a small nanocrystal, it will get absorbed by a big one and then re-emit it. If I emit light out, out of a big one, it will, the light will go through the small nanocrystal because the band gap is bigger. So your PL will shift as you make them thicker. The other thing that will happen is uh, we also observe that if we make a very dilute na a film of nanocrystals, even when you have much, a, a very small, a smaller account of uh, nanocrystals, then your luminescence actually goes up. And the reason for that is because of the, which is initially counterintuitive, but basically the reason for that is that the dielectric constant of uh, let's say is extremely high. It's actually shown in here, luckily for me. So you can see the epsilon one is the dielectric constant of let's sign, that's 25. While the epsilon two on the outside is about two. So the more compact you're making your film, your dielectric constant goes way up. And then you have a lot of internal reflection. It's difficult to get those photons out of your film. If you make them more spread, your effective dielectric constant is very small. It's, and then you get more light coming out of that. At least that's the way we're, we're seeing it at this moment. We, yes? Um, Usually with cadmium selenide, we would put them in a polymer. In this case, we cannot do that because the polymer is absorbing the infrared. So they are, they're like putting them into black tar, basically, for us. And the, the, we, we've been doing, so we, we're just putting, we're just laying them on top of a substrate. And we can avoid any kind of oxidization and everything just by putting inside a cryostat, even when we do room temperature. And then, so that's how we keep them happy. Yes. Can you explain the redshift that we showed in the wavelength based on the four level model that you uh, developed? Yeah, it's possible. We, we're still, we, yes. Uh, it, you mean the redshift between the. Between the uh, incident and the uh, photo emission? Okay, so, so the redshift between the incident. So basically what you're talking about is basically the separation between this state and that state. The, this, right? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think there was a previous curve also. I, yeah, I can show you in the other one. But basic, so basically what you're, what you're talking is about what they refer as the Stoke shift. Yes. Yes, so, it's basic, so this is the Stoke shift is going to depend there's going to be a lot of factors that are going to depend on. So basically you absorb a photon and you're always going to remit it at lower energy. You always have some loss between the absorbed and the emitted photon. In some cases it could be phonons mediated. Sometimes it could be that fine structure that you can be absorbing in the bright state and then emitting in the dark states because the bright states in principle should not absorb. So, so there's a lot of different factors that go into there. I, we haven't looked into complete detail right now. We will so look at it. So when you say phonons, uh, does that correspond to a broad being around the 1x uh, level? Uh, the, the broadening over here? No, I mean in the, in the quantum wells that you show, you're saying that that, at, that state is not exactly the delta function. It's, there's a broadening around. Yeah, the, the reason that there's a broadening is because the size of the nanocrystal is not exactly all the same. Right now, we, we're, we're having homogeneous broadening right now. If all the nanocrystals were the same size, then we would be able to look at that line width and it would be given basically by the lifetime, for instance, of the X step. But because the nanocrystals are very homogeneous from one to, to the other, the line width right now is just giving you the, how, how the dispersion of sizes of your nanocrystals. Yeah. Okay, That's fine. Uh, I'll show you the, uh, yes, I think the one that we were just a minute ago. Yeah, it's the same 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, the second thing, yes. Now that one, of course, has been very controversial. Yes. Uh, because it's supposed to be forbidden because of the inversion symmetry. Yes. And I've never actually looked at nanorods before. I would have thought if I lose my inversion symmetry off the nanorod, all those arguments would say that that peak would get stronger if it's 1 and 1 peak. You it, don't have the forbidden no, selection rule anymore. So why did it disappear? No, it actually goes the other, the other way. So, so basically what... So what he's referring to is this is the 1s to 1s transition. And that should be, this is one photon allowed. So you can grab one photon and go from the 1s to the 1s state. This one over here has been identified as the 1s to 1p state. And that 1s to 1p state should not be allowed, you cannot go from a 1s state to a 1p state with only one photon. So the, the, the discussion is why can I see this state when I should only be seeing it if I have two photons that get me up there. And th that's been the big controversy. Now, in the case of the nanorods, we're not seeing that there. So in the case of the nanorods, it looks like that selection rule is actually holding up the way it should. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay, the, the way that, the way that I, I would have to, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not completely convinced about the inversion, the center, inversion center symmetry argument, but let's just, I, I have an argument in my head if I want to convince myself of how it works, but basically the, the way that it works is uh, you grab lead, you can, in, in the, this is a sodium chloride lattice, so you can have one layer of lead, one of selenium, one of lead, one of selenium, and you can grab your nanocrystal and finish on one side with lead and on the other side with selenium. So if I, if I invert my nanocrystal, it's not symmetric. So, there's an, there, so the argument is that that selection rule has been broken because when I invert my nanocrystal, there's no symmetry with respect to that state. Now, in the case of the nanorods, the way I see it, but it could be very wrong in this moment, again, you're, going to have, you're still going to have your lead, your selenium, your lead, your selenium, your lead. Now, the, the, the matter of fact is what that exciton actually sees. So if I have an exciton in a, if I have an exciton in a, in a nanocrystal, basically the exciton is probing the whole nanocrystal. If I grab a very long nanowire, now that nanowire is longer than the Bohr radius. So in, in my head, the way it would work is if this argument is right, this state would be visible in a nanocrystal, and as I start making my structure longer and longer and longer, this peak should go away. So I don't, think, I don't think this is proof enough, but it kind of goes in the same argument in there, but, but it's, it's, it's one, one way to see it. Yeah. There could be, there, there isn't, I don't know what's the reason for the 1s, 1p. The, a lot of the selection rules are broken in this system. We're seeing the same on the 1s to 1s, and we don't know exactly what that uh, symmetry break, breaking mechanism is. There was a, I, I didn't say this, but in the in this slide over here, the reason that we were looking at the at this exchange energy delta as a function of size is because the, there were some claims that maybe the bright stars were active because of surface states. And in the case of surface states, if the if the ener if the break in the symmetry is because of the surface state, what that would do is that this energy should basically not change when I change the size of my nanocrystal because the surface state doesn't really care about the volume of your nanocrystal. It's a very localized state. And what we're saying right now is that we have a variance and it's the one that we expect of d over d to the cube. So we don't think that the surface state is either the reason that that symmetry is broken either. But. Can I ask one question? Sure. One last question. You mentioned that the, when you're talking about splitting the valley. Yes. Yeah, so, so for these energies, basically, the, we are, we're not, right now, we, we're trying to simplify the, 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 the model as much as we can, and this works pretty well. Our argument to doing that is basically, there's, a, there's work by Sunger, 
where he, met, he calculated the splitting between these levels and that he calls a small delta with respect to this splitting over here. So basically what is important is how big this splitting is with respect to that splitting. So if this is bigger than that guy, then that effect goes away. And according to Sunger's calculations, that level splitting is bigger than this one over here. There's, there's some numbers over there. It's not, it's not an order of magnitude, but maybe a factor of five from what I can think, but maybe even less than that. Okay.